The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Surveys show that the commercials on This Is Your FBI are listened to very carefully. The reason is simple. Our equitable commercial messages treat you like an intelligent human being. Their purpose is to give you useful information. Tonight, for instance, we're going to talk about the Equitable Education Fund, the painless way to pay for college education for your children. Every father and mother with ambitions for their children will welcome this information from the Equitable Society you in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Musical Stick-Up. It has been a rare week in recent years when your FBI has not been involved in headline news of one kind or another. Often those headlines reported the capture of a dangerous criminal. Sometimes they merely heralded the entrance of the Bureau into a case. For the most part, though, the cases involved were well-publicized crimes. A kidnapping, a bank robbery, or a murder which caught the interest of the nation. However... To make a deduction from those headlines that special agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation work exclusively on spectacular infractions of the law would be to arrive at a false conclusion. Your FBI has jurisdiction over approximately 120 federal laws. And in the space of any given year, it investigates thousands upon thousands of violations of those laws. Part of the training of every special agent teaches him that no individual case is to be given precedence while another remains uninvestigated. The reason behind that is relatively simple. To the men of your FBI, there are no unimportant crimes or unimportant lawbreakers, for every criminal remains a menace to you, the American people, until his capture or his death. Tonight's file opens on a lonely mountain road in a northwestern state. The blackness of the night breeds quiet, the only sound for miles around being made by an ancient car wheezing along the highway. All right. Mm. What did you think of me tonight on that second course of wandering, huh? That's what you woke me up for? I didn't know you were sleeping. Look, I got a tip for you. Anytime you see me with my eyes closed and my head leaning back on something soft, take all the eight to five you can get. I'm sleeping. Uh, didn't you think the horn sounded good tonight? Hal, you're a nice kid and I like you. But what difference does it make how your horn sounded? Huh? If you held high C for an hour and a half, do you think those round haircuts would know what you're doing? They'd like it better if you whistled Dixie through a mouthful of peanut butter. You know something? One guy at the dance said he's been to every senior prom they've ever had, and I play the hottest trumpet of anybody in the history of the school. Who was he? A music teacher. <laughs> a long hair. Well, that doesn't mean he's a square. He loves jazz, too, same way we do. Well, don't cut me in for a full share. I not only don't love it, sometimes I don't even like it. You don't like working with a band? Working with Gene Forrest and his Lonesome Pines? Kid, I don't want to hit you with a cornball, but I've seen better bands on nickel cigars. If you hate it that much, why stick around? I got a habit I don't want to break. Eating. Larry. What? Can you see what that is? Up ahead on the right-hand side? No, but you better slow down. All right. I can make it out now. Somebody's had an accident. Well, it's a sense it didn't park upside down. Pull over. Okay. I'll take a look. There's a guy in there. He looks dead. 
he, he is. I wish he wouldn't moan. Uh, you think we can get him out? I don't know. Maybe. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I got him. Can I give you a hand? Yeah. Oh. Just shove that seat forward. I can put him in the back of our car. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh. There you are. Come on, let's get him to a doctor. Meanwhile, in a nearby town, County Sheriff Ned Campbell is just being greeted by a visitor. Hello, Sheriff. I'm Jim Taylor. Howdy, Taylor. I'm the new resident agent down here. Oh, yeah. Harry told me you'd be in. How long's your assignment? Well, just the two weeks that Harry's away on vacation. Well, it looks like you walked right into something. Oh, what do you mean? Biggest case we've had here in a year just broke half an hour ago. Oh? Any FBI jurisdiction? Yes. Two men held up at the north gate at the National Park. Mm -hmm. Got away with a day's receipts. How much would that be? Fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars. Did you get any details, Sheriff? Yeah, one of the gatemen just called in. Bandits cut the phone wire at the station. That gave him a half an hour start. Mm -hmm. Could he describe the man? No, not satisfactorily. But he did get full details on the car they used, including the license number. I've already sent out the alarm. Good. I'm going out to interview the gate man. You want to come along? Or maybe I'd better stick around here and try to get a lead on who's the registered owner of that getaway car. I've already wired the state capitol for that. I shouldn't want to stay here in case a report comes in on the alarm. Well, I have two-way radio equipment in my car. Well, in that case, Sheriff, let's go. Oh. How is he, Larry? Oh. He sounds like a Spike Jones arrangement. <laughs> Lucky to be alive. You ever see a cut like that one on his head? I took a worse one when I joined this crummy band. It's a good bandage you're putting on. You're a real pro. Oh, I ought to be. You ever hear of a little musical group called Harvey's Hot Shots? Oh. That was way back. We played nothing but one night stand. Places Rand McNally ain't heard about yet. Uh, got enough cloth? I think so. What an outfit that was. I blew a horn, sang vocals, tap danced, and set bones. It sounds rugged. Rugged? Sometime you should make jumps where the bus turns over every night. You get on the way up with a bass fiddle that's coming down. Oh. Yeah, you have a point, killer. Larry, we're going to be late getting to the hotel. We're going to be real late. I'm going to eat. Hey, you ate once. And I played one. Oh, I think this guy's getting with it. Yeah. Uh, Take it easy, pal. Huh? Nah, Who nah. You? Don't huh? try to sit up. It's okay. I can make it. Okay? Yeah, there. Ah. Yeah. How do you feel? Oh, I can't tell you. Where am I? On the road. Who are you? We're musicians. How did I get here? Larry lifted you out of your car and carried you. You, Larry? Mm-hmm. Thanks. Forget it. Hey. There's the painted rock. Now, relax, pal. We'll have you to the doctor pretty soon. No doctor for me. Now, look, if I was you, I would... Don't talk. Just listen. Hey. What's with that gun? Tell your friend to stay on this road till I tell him to turn off. Getaway car, all right, Taylor. But I don't see how they could both have walked away from a wreck like that. Well, it looks like the car turned over in midair when they blew that right front tire. Mm-hmm. Well, that'd mean that it didn't make those tire tracks just this side of the highway. No, it couldn't have. Sheriff. Yeah? I'd borrow your flashlight for a minute. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Well, take a look at these footprints. They must be fresh ones. If they'd have been made before that rain this afternoon, they wouldn't be this clear. Uh, look at this set. Made by an odd pair of shoes. Yeah. Seems like there were metal plates attached to the soles and heels. I never saw boots like that. Sheriff, I'd say the prints going back toward the highway are deeper than the set coming toward the car. Doesn't it look that way to you? Yeah. You know, somebody might have been passing by, stopped when he saw the wreck. Carried one of the bandits back to his car. Yeah, but that would only account for one of them. Well, this single set of prints on the other side of the wreck accounts for the other one. Looks to me like he got away under his own power. Sheriff, you carry any plaster of Paris in your car? 
Yeah, there's a regular kit in the trunk. Okay, let's get it out and make impressions of all these prints. You. You up front. What? See that cabin? Pull up there. Yes, sir. Well, pal, it was sure nice giving you a lift. You're coming in with me. Well, now, we really got to run along. Get out. Okay. You too. All right, if I take my horn. Take it and get out. Now walk. When you get to the door, go on in. Just push it open. Is that you, Gus? Yeah, Pearl. Oh, I'm glad you're back. I was starting... Yes, you're hurt. Oh, I'm okay. You sure? Uh-huh. Who were they? They give me a lift home. Me and Ray blew a tire and cracked up. You two, sit over there. Where is Ray? He wasn't hurt, so he took the money bag and headed for town to get another car. You let him walk off with the money? I tried to stop him, but I passed out. When I come to, I was riding with them. You got any idea where Ray is now? Well, knowing him like I do, I can guess. He got into town with that money, went to Willie's place, and started buying drinks for the house. Uh, take the car outside and go call Willie's place. But now? Yeah. Yeah. Mind if one of us goes along and calls a guy we work for? Sit down. He'll fire us if we don't get back. Don't you hear good... Sit down, Hal. Should I talk to Ray if he's there? No, just come back and tell me. All right. If I ain't in the house when you get back, don't get scared. Where are you going? No place unless those two make a move. If they do, you can look for me out back. I'll be burying them. We will return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official files of the FBI. Now a special message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society to fathers and mothers of young children. Yes, you're proud of those youngsters today. But you're going to be even prouder 15 years from now when one of them writes you a letter. Dear Mom and Dad, it sure is wonderful to be here in college. I signed up for a lot of... That future college freshman of yours will be sitting on top of the world, and he'll have three mighty good reasons for doing so. First, college men and women earn more money. Last night, the dean made an address to the freshman class. He said that college grads earn $72,000 more during their working years the non-college men. <laughs> How's that for a bright future? Second, college men land the bigger jobs. The dean also said that if you take 16 men who are being paid $10,000 or more, 15 of the 16 have college degrees. Third, college men get more out of life. They learn to concentrate on problems and think them through. They gain culture and appreciation which enriches their whole life. Think that over, fathers and mothers, and decide now to give your children that big head start toward success that goes with a college education. Decide to make sure by starting an equitable education fund now. An equitable education fund? What's that? It's the painless way to pay for your children's college education. In this equitable society plan, you start when your children are young. Then each year, you pay a sum of money that doesn't hurt, an amount that scarcely makes a dent in your budget. When your youngster's ready for college, the money's all ready for him. Well, that's spreading the cost of education over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a beating in four. Right. Now, suppose the father dies or becomes totally disabled. Then no more payments are necessary. The fund becomes fully established. When the youngster is ready for college, he gets the same education as if his dad had lived. So don't delay a day longer. Let your equitable society representative show you how little it costs to start an equitable education fund. All right, care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, the musical stick-up. No one over the age of understanding in these United States needs the word crime explained to him. For we are all only too familiar with it. And yet with all the public knowledge about crime and criminals, 
there still remains one important point almost invariably overlooked. The victim of any crime anywhere in the nation is not a faceless, impersonal being who travels about being a perpetual victim. The average person caught in the deep net of crime is, in the majority of cases, a decent, law-abiding citizen. Take the file which the Federal Bureau of Investigation has chosen for dramatization this evening. A case in which two men did what most people would have done under the same set of circumstances. They stopped to see if anyone in a wrecked automobile needed help. Your FBI does not advise any listener to avoid stopping at a wrecked car. For the point to bear in mind is that in this country, with major crimes being committed at the rate of three a minute, around the clock, crime is an encroaching factor in our daily lives. And that the two men being held at gunpoint in a forsaken cabin need not have been them, but might have been any other two people in the nation. Might indeed have been any two of you. Tonight, file continues at the office of Sheriff Ned Campbell. Sorry, I had to leave you here alone, Taylor. Well, that's okay, Sheriff. We're making a little progress. Oh, in what direction? While you were gone, a man named Forrest was in to file a complaint. Forrest? He's a band leader at the hotel. Oh, yeah. Well, his outfit played a high school dance tonight about 40 miles up the highway. Two of the men made the trip in a car belonging to Forrest, and he thinks they've stolen it. Why? Well, the other musicians have all returned. Forrest said he heard this pair talking yesterday about going to San Francisco. Well, you think this ties in with the National Park robbery? Well, I'm not sure, but it very well might. Oh, how? Forrest mentioned that one of the missing musicians was also a tap dancer. Well, that made me think of those impressions of metal heel and toe plates that we found with the wrecked car. Forrest said the dancer wore shoes like that. Oh. And leaving the high school dance when they did, they'd have gone past the wreck at just about the right time. Mm-hmm. Sheriff, I got a description on the car and the musicians. The alarm's already gone out. Has Forrest any pictures of these men? Yeah, he's sending them right over. Larry. What? You think that guy's going to stay in the next room? I don't know. Well, if he does, maybe we could try to sneak out, huh? What, are you a hero? Well, no, but The we... way our legs are tied to these chairs, the first move we make this place would sound like a bowling alley. But we can't just sit here. Yes, we can. What are you doing? Getting my horn. What for? Well, maybe somebody will hear it and come and help us. It's also liable to drive them further away. Well, let's find out. Oh, this is a great time to audition. Uh-oh. All right, all right, cut that out. Uh, I was I was just practicing. Put that thing away. But I'm a musician. Hold it. Yeah? I'm in here. Did you call Willie's place? Uh-huh. You were right. Ray was there, huh? Yeah, Ray was there and drinking heavy. On my money. Pearl, you stay here. Where are you going? To Willie's place. I'll get the money and come back for you. You keep an eye on them. Mm. You know where my other gun is. Uh-huh. Get it out. If they give you any trouble, use it. Sheriff, how many side roads run up into the hills? Well, counting the trails, I'd say about a uh, hundred between here and Bentley Falls. You got enough volunteer deputies to comb every one of them? No, not near enough. Well, pardon me, sir. Certainly. Sheriff Campbell speaking. Yes, Steve. Oh, you did? Where? Yeah, when was that? Uh-huh. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. Bye. One of my men just saw the musician's car heading east on the highway. East? It was heading west before, wasn't it? Uh-huh. How about alerting the other deputies? Pete's already done that by phone. Good. Now, where did you see the car? Near Liberty Hill. Here, come over the map. I can show you better. Okay. Yeah, here we are. Now, this is the highway along through here. Yeah. Well, here's Rock Point, where that first report came from. Well, that's when the car was heading west. That's right. Mm-hmm. Now, this is Liberty Hill, where Pete just saw it heading east. Now, Sheriff, from what Forrest told me about that car, nobody's averaging better than a mile a minute, even on the highway. No, probably not. And that first report came in, let's see, that's exactly 27 minutes ago. Mm Mm-hmm. So the car couldn't have gone more than 27 miles west of Rock Point before it turned around and headed east. 27 miles, 
be about right here. All right, now, how many dirt roads off the highway between Rock Point and where you've got your finger now? 20, 25. Still too many to cover. Maybe not. We know what the tire tracks of the musician's car looks like, and that rain might have softened those dirt roads enough so that we'd be able to follow them. Yeah. Sheriff, if we find out where that car has been, we've got a good chance of finding out where it's headed now. Look, ma'am, why don't you let us go? No. Well, at least you gave it some thought. You sit in there till Gus comes back. Well, how long will he be gone? No telling. <laughs> what are you doing? Getting my horn. I want to practice a little. It quiets my nerves. <laughs> don't try anything, Get girl. Get Sheriff. I'll keep you covered. I ain't done nothing, Sheriff. Hey, will somebody untie us? Sure. I'll take care of that. Just stand here, Pearl. Look, Sheriff, there must be some mistake. Be quiet. Yeah. Put your feet up. Yeah. I'll cut those ropes. <laughs> Nice of you two to drop by. You're the men who work for Gene Forrest, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, there you are. Thanks. When you stopped on the highway at that wrecked car, did you pick up one or two men? One. Uh, your car's gone from outside. Who's using it? The, the guy who lives here. That does it. Yeah, thanks. That'll be Gus Sheridan, Jim. No? You know where he went? His friend, a guy named Ray something, sashayed with the L-double-O-T and stopped at a grog joint named Willie's place. This Gus went to find him. Where's uh, Willie's place, Sheriff? In town. Say, the other holdup man must be Ray Price. Him, yeah. Sheridan, are friends. They hang out at Willie's. Any uh, a back road we might take to head Sheridan off before he gets there? No, but I can call in on the radio and have a couple of my men waiting for him. Okay. Let's get them out of here. <laughs> See any of your deputies? Yeah, there's one. Hello, Sheriff. Hi, Carl. This is Agent Taylor of the FBI, Deputy Terry. Hiya, Hello, Taylor. Terry. When we got your call, we went inside and arrested Ray Price. He put away already? Yeah, George took him to the jailhouse. Then we waited for Sheridan. Didn't he show up? Yep, but he spotted us first and started firing. He wounded Bill and Frank. Oh, bad? No, no, just flesh wounds. Anybody able to wing him? No, not so you could notice. He fired a full clip and then turned and ran toward the quarry. I got men stationed all around. Where is this quarry, Chuck? About a half mile up the hill. I think he's still in there? I imagine so. A uh, dark night like this, though, it'd be tough to rot him out. Well, we can just keep the place covered till morning. He might get away. I think we ought to go in there tonight. Well, I'll go in with you, Chuck. Okay, let's go. <laughs> We could see something. Yeah. Think there's any chance that moon will break through? Uh, I doubt it. Sheriff. Yeah. What's the physical layout in here? Well, we should be just about in the heart of the quarry. Yeah. It's surrounded on three sides by steep rock walls. Where would he hide? Loose stone blocks. You could find shelter behind one of them. Well, let's hold it here. Yeah. Yeah. Back down behind this rock. I'll see if I can holler him out. Okay. Hold him! Hold him! Hold him! Hold him! We know you're in here. You're in here. You can't escape, Charlie. You're in here. Shoot! Shoot! Hear me, Sheridan! I hear you! I hear you! Come and get Come me! And get me. Does that give you any idea where he is? No, not with that echo bouncing around. Sheriff? Yeah? Let's just keep still for a while. Now that he knows we're in here with him, it might have an effect on him. Do something. Do something. Come on, do something. I think the time is right. 
Pete. Sheriff, what are you doing? I'm going to throw this rock. I think you got him, Taylor. Throw your flash over there. Yeah, you got him good. Okay, let's get him out of here. Ray Price, the accomplice of the fatally wounded Gus Sheridan, was convicted in federal court on a charge of armed robbery on a government reservation and sentenced to a term of 15 years. Pearl Sheridan was also convicted of being an accessory to armed robbery after the fact and sentenced to serve five years. Once inside the abandoned stone quarry, Special Agent Taylor realized it would be impossible to see where Gus Sheridan was hiding. He also realized that the first to fire would give away his position. By throwing the sliver of rock some distance from where he and Sheriff Campbell were standing, he forced Sheridan into firing at the noise and thus forced him to expose his hiding place. And so another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was closed. Like so many other cases, this one could not have been completed as quickly nor maybe even so successfully without the constant cooperation given Agent Taylor by the county sheriff and his men. Sometimes that cooperation comes to a special agent from a big city policeman or a state trooper or any others whose chosen profession is war against crime. Without that help, your FBI would find it almost impossible to operate. For which reason, we take this opportunity publicly to thank every local law enforcement officer in the nation. They deserve your thanks, too. Give them your support, and they will remain what they have always been, your first line of defense against crime. Now, one last word to fathers and mothers. Of all the things you can do for your children, there's no greater proof of your love for them than an equitable education fund. They'll be grateful for it as long as they live. Your boy or girl may only say a few words like, Thanks, Mom, and thank you, Dad. But you know from the look in his eye and the ring in his voice that he'll never forget your foresight in starting an equitable education fund. Right now, make that wise resolution to see your equitable representative soon. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a case exposing a new and vicious criminal racket. Its subject, homicide. Its title, The Swing Shift Racketeer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were... Jim Bannon, Tom Brown, Walter Catlett, J.C. Flippin, Wally Mayer, and Peggy Weber. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swing Shift Racketeers on This Is Your FBI. Stay tuned for the adventures of the Thin Man. Fun and excitement for the whole family when the Thin Man comes your way.